Welcome everyone. We're trying out the waiting room for the first time. <laughs> now that Zoom Bomber has been added to our collective vocabulary. Yeah, it's nice to see you all. We'll be getting going in just a moment here. Uh, if you have not yet accessed the Google document, that should be in the chat. Good to see a lot of familiar faces. Indeed, indeed. That's good. All right, well, we have a, a lot to cover, so I wanna go ahead and get started on time. Uh, we have the link to the Google document there in the chat. If you find it, if you're on a mobile device or for any reason would prefer not to leave the Zoom space, please go ahead and drop um, who you are, where you're from, and um, any contact information you want you have associated with yourself and uh, Jen or I will go ahead and copy that into the Google Docs so you can review that later. Um, otherwise Google, Google Docs just gives our um, sort of the biography of the of the presenters, it gives the um, who's present and it gives the agenda. So the agenda is pretty simple. We're going to do some brief welcome and introductions. We're going to be looking at uh, our, what's happening for our next meeting so you can start planning ahead for that. And um, I'll give you a little bit more housekeeping, and then I'm going to hand it over to our facilitators, Suzanne and Jennifer. Um, so in terms of housekeeping, uh, first of all, our next meeting will be August 18th, 2020. You probably have noticed, those of you who have been with us for a while, that we're really trying hard to give voice to more people in the community by encouraging other people to facilitate these sessions. Um, this one and the last one have been a little bit more pre presentation formatted. It doesn't have to be that way, though we encourage that as well. It could just be you're going to facilitate a conversation. And so if you have an idea for what you think is timely and valuable to this community, please just shoot an email to, to me, to Jen, or to Jody, and we'd be glad to, um, to invite you to be a co-facilitator either for August 18th or for a future event. Um, and so you probably saw in your email that we have released a charter for this organization. We feel like we are making a lot of progress as a group. Um, and it's time to begin formalizing a little bit um, in terms of who we are and where we're going and what we want to accomplish together. So we sent out that charter. It's also linked in the uh, document that's in the chat. And so please take a look at that. And sometime in the next month, I'm going to be sending out a poll to the community um, and just asking for any feedback that you have and um, if you would agree, basically, with, with what that charter stands for. We want it to represent everybody in this community, not just the people who put it together. Um, as that's one of our core values with this network is one of grassroots collaboration. And so we wanna hear your voices on that. And we're very excited for new potentials and opportunities for this network, network moving forward. On that note, I also wanna point out a lot of people have been asking about the Digicon, which we did last October um, as an inaugural event. We are planning to do a Digicon again. <laughs> and we thought this time we'd actually move into the winter real estate since there's not a lot of um, competition for that in terms of other conferences. So right now we're penciling a January date for the Digicon. It'll actually be 2021 um, at that point and good riddance to 2020. Um, so if you're interested in being part of that, um, there will be opportunity to sign up and get involved in that in multiple ways, including being a presenter, but other things as well. Um, so Suzanne and, Je and Je um, Jennifer have their bios listed in the document, so I won't go into great detail except to say that these are two fantastic um, people from the University of North Florida who are deeply invested in student voices and in amplifying student voices in the process of implementing UDL, and they're going to share about that a little with us today. So Jen and Suzanne. Well, thanks. Uh, so I see the number. That's the thing with Zoom is you see the number of how many people have come on for the session. So uh, we kind of went into it with a frame of work that we've done before. So I want to support this group, or I should say we want to support this group specifically in that this is a conversation. So we'll share some information, talking points, uh, 
some of our experiences, thoughts, ideas, but at any point, uh, you know, we kind of did it with the presentation, but I, we're not, we're flexible people. Uh, I think we're all flexible for a number of reasons now, but uh, our hope is that part of our conversation and experiences here are shared, not just us talking to all of you, because we're here to learn as much as you are. Uh, so we, when sitting down to talk about this presentation, had it on our agenda, I want to say, for a couple of months and far before COVID-19. And so when about a month ago, it started to come back on our radar with, oh, we have that coming along. And thinking about our topic that we had originally proposed, it seemed timely to bring the conversation uh, to get woven together with what we had done and mapping out the work that we had done in the last say year and a half and then really how it's changed our perspectives and our work over the last two to three months. So we're here to share some of what we've done. We would love to know what you're doing uh, because we will be happy to, you know, share, replicate, um, create and so forth with others um, of similar interests and goals. Um, Jen, do you want, I think you should talk about the title too briefly before we jump in, in terms of our <laughs> revelation. Um, yeah, so we retitled uh, what we were going to do today, Moving Beyond Panagogy, um, when future instruction is still uncertain. So I'm not sure how many of you have heard that term, um, panagogy, but it's been um, being used quite a bit um, out in the field right now. And it's really just this um, awareness of the fact that this is not virtual instruction. We did not move to teaching online. Um, nobody had time to develop their courses in the way that um, we typically would. And so it's, it's really just an awareness of what are the student needs right now? What are the faculty needs? What are the needs? And um, how can we keep that in our mindset as we're moving forward with instruction? And we were kind of aware of not only has the current um, climate for instruction changed, but also we're really unsure of what the fall looks like. Um, really everyone is right now, um, whether you're in um, teacher preparation or other things. And so for us, we're thinking about the fact that in teacher preparation, even if we're back in in college, K-12 schools may not be back in. So what does that look like? Um, and just keeping that in mind as we think about how does UDL um, impact that and how might that look different than it maybe did a couple months ago. So we will probably sound like we're jumping forwards and backwards because we have really two frames in this and our what we've uh, brought to the table in terms of conversation and one was a, a, uh, a pilot research study that we had uh, conducted previously and maybe some of you we've already seen at um, UDLRN um, and then the and some of you not uh, but also what Jen was just saying the now but the two really in our minds we kept ping-ponging even in conversation around when we were designing some of our ideas um, for today and then thinking about what what has happened uh, pretty rapidly. And what has happened um, is that, um, I don't see a PowerPoint, but I think you're getting that up, right? Are you getting the- Oh, I think I have, do I, can you not see it? I can show, you have a no, secondary monitor? Like you may have shown. shared we your see screen. <laughs> yeah. What Everybody's am I sharing? Monitor. It's just a desktop, um, like a black desktop. Your desktop. Hmm. Okay, well, we're going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to try that again. Because... I'll go on the record that this so works perfectly Zoom before So, Zoom call demo, <laughs> flexibility with your students, hashtag UDL. <laughs> No, uh, exactly. Nothing Thank you. ever I works perfect in technology when you talk about technology. And I did it exactly. <laughs> Can you see it now or yes. no? You just have to go. I think you're, that's right. Yes, it's yes, perfect. You're good. Yeah. You can? You're good. I literally did yes. nothing different in case anyone was curious. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> So to give us a sense of, you know, uh, I, I think Eric shared already a bit about who we are. We, Jen and I work in different departments in our college and uh, we've been working heavily on, 
increasing the conversation around universal design for learning, both within our departments, within our college, and within our university. And as you all know, that is very easy to do. You just decide to do it, and then it happens. Um, no ITs. So it, it, it's infrastructure, and it's conversation, and it's everything from uh, working with our students to working with our colleagues uh, to day-to-day -day experiences with, within our physical environment, which now we don't necessarily have. Um, so that's our role. We're both faculty. I'm faculty in the Educational uh, Technology Training and Development Program, and Jen is Deaf Education. So, um, and we've been working together on this work for a couple of years now, and our, our, our conversations ebb and flow in the college. I would say that they're not necessarily consistent. I would, and we're going to, we will talk in a bit about what we're doing now. I think the last month we have seen, much like a lot of you, I think Eric, you even posted on um, maybe one of your initiatives, we've seen the conversation around UDL just quadruple. Um, and so that's kind of what led us to this kind of conversation. And I, I'm curious, I think we're all curious from the group, if you're seeing that same rise in interest. I think being home maybe and being available to technology and social media and conversations in a different way than maybe we had before, I see some yeses. Uh, so that's really expedited a lot of our work and commitment as well. Um, so we'll move through some of our research here and, and conversation around the work that we did and then we're going to talk a little bit about how that kind of led up to our, uh, if I dare say, our positioning. We had set the foundation for the timing of everybody being excited about it with, hey, we've already planted the seed and we're ready for you. We've been waiting, right? <laughs> um, so if you want to hit next slide or do you want um, to add to this one? And I would just add to that that um, my background is in special education and in deaf education. So I think we all come to UDL from different um, places. And so for me, it's, I'm really interested in looking at the intersection of universal design for learning and access um, when it comes to really everyone and how that kind of leads to equity. I'm trying. There we go. Well, so we're going to share a bit about our study and some of our data, um, and then we'll share some reflections on, you know, our work in higher education, and then specifically how we're looking at uh, ways faculty are leveraging UDL to support students specifically for this particular shift in time. So, um, where did we start? Jen? So, we were, um, for me, um, as someone in teacher preparation, I think a lot about our teacher candidates, um, but our college in general does a lot to support both current teachers and um, our up and coming teacher candidates. And so we started thinking like, what is it that impacts the outcomes of their practices? So um, them using UDL in the classroom how, what impacts that? And so we started thinking about what is modeled in their classes and in the professional development that they take, which led us to question what are the current practices and beliefs at UNF. So we started with doing a survey um, and we collected data and our questions were all focused on perceived accessibility. So it was really about the perceptions of the participants. Um, and we asked them about their experiences in the classroom, the design of the materials that were being used in classes, and their understanding of what is uni universal design for learning. Um, we, at our university, the way that you have to send out surveys is very interesting. <laughs> um, and so we are not <laughs> able Yes, uh, we are not able to just send things out on listservs and that sort of thing because our email addresses at our university are not directory. Um, and so, meaning no one can come and just find our email addresses. So because of that, it's, it's a privilege that we have access to them. So we are not allowed to send out surveys. It has to go through our institution um, research office and they send it out and they have very strict protocols about how many times they can send something out and the time frame and what percentage of faculty and students get it. So this isn't sent out to all of the faculty and students, even though we would have preferred it to be that way, they only send it out to a percentage of them and it's like sort of a rolling thing. Jen, a quick question from the chat. Um, 
it was sent to me privately. How is accessibility being defined in your context? Um, in terms of, I'm not sure exactly what the question is, if that's what my, when, since I mentioned accessibility and like what my interest is. Um, and to me, I would just say that's a, a perceived accessibility. So on the part of the individual, do they feel that they have complete access to the material versus a, what does the law or the standard or the regulation um, require? Because those are two really different things. Suzanne, do you want Thank to you. add anything to that? I, I was right there with you because we've had this conversation fairly regularly. Um, and we have this conversation, okay. I just want to say that since we're talking about um, higher ed and practice and experiences, uh, I would imagine that there are there is quite a variation in terms of what that conversation looks like with different units, um, different individuals, different initiatives mm -hmm. um, in terms of that. And I think that's why it's a great question because we've actually had that conversation collectively as as a team, but it's not necessarily a shared or, and not that everybody has to think the same necessarily, but I think we try to look at the um, um, its meaning to our, our context. Yeah, so perfectly said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess I can add to this too. Um, so I look at it as a professional who works in a field um, in special education and deaf education, but also I'm visually impaired myself. So I sort of come at it from the, the personal angle and whether or not I have access to things um, as a faculty member at our university. So um, that kind of impacts my lens as well. Um, so we, as I was saying, we didn't, uh, we weren't able to invite as many as we would have hoped. Um, and so we didn't get as big of participation as we would have hoped. And obviously that impacts um, the conclusions that we can draw. But we had 23 faculty fill it out um, and 105 students. And there was, they kind of got different surveys. So you'll see that the faculty had 38 questions, whereas the students only had 23. And um, I mentioned before that it was the participants' perceptions. So we just kind of want to hit on that to, to say this isn't necessarily um, what is exactly happening. That's something that's really difficult to measure because um, we, we all perceive things differently. And so <laughs> Merriam-Webster uh, defines <laughs> perceptions as a result of perceiving observation. Um, and a mental image or concept. So we just kind of wanted to throw that out there um, because all of the questions are really based on this, how the individuals, whether they were faculty or um, students, it was really their perceptions of what was happening in class. Suzanne? Ah, so we, the, you know, as uh, was shared, we would have liked a larger sample size, uh, but we did ask the students one of the questions, which was the following, which of the following best describes the use of multiple formats of representation of information in your courses? So perception of our questions, perception of what that might mean. Well, we know that, that this was, again, a pilot project for us. We wanted to test the waters in terms of what we were observing ourselves and what we had experienced ourselves and put it into a context of what is actually happening. Um, and I don't know that we are measuring what's actually happening, but we're getting a taste of how do we reshape some of these ideas and think about our own work, but then also kind of loop back again. It will be very interesting if we think about doing this again in this time, in this era. Um, but use of multiple formats, we have, you know, that, that instructors, instructor regularly uses multiple formats of representation in every lecture, only 10%. Instructor regularly uses one to two formats of representation, but occasionally more, 63%. I do not receive multiple formats of, represent, of representation, but would like my instructors to provide multiple, which we were surprised about. Um, some of our feedback uh, of what students did respond with, uh, what they knew, what they experienced, and what they wanted. Um, and I'm not interested in my instructor using multiple formats, 9%. So again, it's what, what does that mean to a student? Do they know what that means necessarily um, in the context that we're providing? But we did ask the question. Next. Do your instructors provide multiple ways for you, for you to demonstrate your knowledge, skills, and or practice? And students replied with yes, sometimes and no in terms of multiple ways to demonstrate a skill. Next. 
So for this one is from our faculty survey that we distributed. Um, for, you'll see in some of the upcoming data, some of the, I think some of the uh, responses and comments were interesting in terms of how they aligned with this portion. How likely would you be to make changes to your lecture that minimize the need for student accommodations? Um, somewhat likely and neither likely nor unlikely, um, somewhat unlikely and extremely unlikely. We had somewhat, and then, I'm sorry, I missed the top, which is the extremely likely um, in terms of the faculty. Again, a small sample, we know. Um, but again, feeding our, our loop in terms of understanding. Uh, you can see here some of the interesting responses that we received from that corresponding question, which was, it depends on the effort. So we saw a lot of themes in terms of time, workload. Um, I, we thought this statement, the second one, I'm not sure what question number eight is. And if the question above, it is a bit unclear, disability accommodations. Um, and so while that says it the way that it says it still says something, right? The absence of something is not nothing. Uh, for us, it meant, oh, uh, do we have a full, if we, well, even lexicon, a shared vocabulary that we use in terms of um, some of this language. And so like when you ask, what do you mean by necessary accessibility in the context of what we're talking about? It's those kinds of conversations that brought to life from some of this work. Yep. Yes. Do you want to take one, Jen? Sure. Um, we also asked the faculty, how likely would you be to make changes to your exams or quizzes that minimize the need for student accommodations? And 28% um, were extremely likely, 42% were somewhat likely, 14% neither likely or unlikely, 14% somewhat unlikely, and zero said extremely unlikely. And then we asked them, so what are your hesitations regarding the changes that you would make to those? And um, they, similar things. So the workload, you know, I have 130 students. Um, short answer or essays are hard to accommodate given my class sizes, same thing. Um, somebody said unsure how to present calculations in a different format. So it's kind of like that idea that um, I've always had it in this way, so I don't know another way. Um, and then someone who said licensing exams are multiple choice, so I'm preparing my students using that format. Um, I'll use other formats for other assignments, but tests are always going to be in the same format of the licensing exams. Um, and then it depends on the trade-offs for other students, so I don't want to um, make accommodations for some students if it's not going to meet the needs of other students or if it's going to diminish what they're getting in some way. So before we go on, I want to answer the question, did you get any pushback from the student success office? I don't know that it, they know any of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that kind of leads into like the other part of what we're talking about, which is the conversation around a lot of this really hasn't come to light until the last couple months. Do we want to share it? Have we tried to share it? Have we eagerly been waiting for the invitation to the table to have the conversation? Absolutely. And every chance we get, Jen as my witness and my me as hers, every time there's a meeting or a conversation and it, there is that moment, I'm sure they see our hand and we're the ones that they're going to talk about UDL. We do find we do make an effort to you know put a spotlight on those opportunities where you can make those changes. But it's such a great point because I don't even know um, how far and wide it's been disseminated internally. Yep. Um, and and I also it sort of depends on what um, that title of that office, what that is at each university. So. Um, if we're talking about um, our disability resource um, office, that um, at our university, to be quite um, blunt, is very um, not interested in UDL. Um, we have had trainings where they have um, essentially said that if you are providing accommodations to students that you are treating them like they have disabilities and you can't do that if they're not registered with the Disability Resource Center. So there have been kind of some really sticky um, different differing opinions when it comes to that um, and so they don't know that we've done this research and I'm not sure what their perspectives would be if they um, 
heard this. This is recorded. That's fantastic. Um, it's from but, a space of yeah. looking forward and, and opportunities for improvement. So, um, yeah. Yes. Right. So, yes. Um, yes. we did ask, um, which of the following do you regularly experience in your face-to-face -face courses? And that was one of the questions that we asked both students and faculty. Um, and so more than 10% of the students said slides, like everybody said that, um, whiteboard, pictures and images, diagrams and charts. Uh, and then less than 10% of the students named other um, forms of representation. And so um, you could see that there were document camera, videos, models, guest speakers, small group discussions, hands-on activities, clickers, devices, online discussions, social media, and websites. So we had so many um, that they could choose from and less than 10% of respondents chose anything other than those four main things. So essentially, the majority of professors um, and the majority of students indicated that what's being used are slides that may have some of those things in there and then they might also go to the whiteboard a bit. Um, so our additional um, observations we did ask about what do you know about UDL? Um, how familiar are you with it? And out of the faculty, 59% um, of them said they were slightly familiar and 36% said they were moderately familiar. And then with the students, 88% of them said um, not at all or slightly familiar. Um, and 6% said moderately familiar. Um, and so, that was an interesting takeaway for us to say like, wow, students don't even know um, what it is and they don't know that it's sort of a possibility. So how could they advocate to ask for it? Even if that's like filling out your, um, re the reviews at the end of a semester to say, what um, could the instructor have done to better improve my learning? They don't know to say, you know, using universal design for learning even in other words. Um, and so they may not be able to advocate for themselves if they don't know that it's there. Um, and then one of the really important things uh, or interesting things that we noted was that if we, uh, we had them out of the students, they said what their majors were. And the ones who were in the sciences, the majority of them said that they didn't want um, multiple means of engagement, which was, interesting um we thought to our findings so we and again we were this is our this is our like you know glimpse into hmm because like i said we would like a larger sample size i've had this we had this conversation at udlirn in a dream world we'd have a mar much larger sample to to dive deeper into all of this um and so we have some we've hit on some exciting conversations. So I want to like dip into some of those questions because there's some great ones that um, might require some conversation. Yes. So I think I'm going back to Tom's question, which is that colleges are looking at UDL as an either or solution that accommodations are required. So you can't mess with that system or you don't even hear the discussion about how the accommodation will be necessary if UDL is used. So this is where we get into that, why we talk about having conver those conversations together because because we're in that complicated space, and I think that's maybe what you're also, um, and how do you and they define universal design for learning? So I find the more we dive into universal design for learning, I mean, I can get a very simple cut and paste answer. It's integration is constantly reinventing itself in terms of the more we apply it and the more that we um, use it as a framework, the more that we use it as maybe practice, the more that we use it as um, a, a guide in terms of uh, conversations. So we're going to get into a lot of our now what in terms of how we're moving our conversation forward and maybe away from other conversations. So I don't know if that answers your question because I think we're still defining what UDL means for our group. Um, and it is moving away from that um, prescriptive, or at least it's our intent, if I may speak on our behalf, Jen, to move from a prescriptive 
situation and more of a inclusive um, design structure. I come from, you know, really instructional design and design thinking world, which um, inclusive design has really, I mean, it's made a place in space and is, is almost um, number one. Um, and so, it, you know, kind of from that design for all um, mentality is easier to navigate than maybe some other structures that we have within higher education. I don't know if yours is the same or the different. Um, and yes, idea, uh, UD at the heart is defined by providing options and choices. So I wonder if students are concerned with instructors trying too hard to engage them. Yes. So it is a matter of interpretation of what we don't know we need to know more about here. And so we've got some ongoing conversation. Um, but there was a question, and I'm not sure what the comment was. Jen, if you remember, can you confirm um, this was in a school of education in a teacher prep program? And I don't know, Donna, what you meant by that. If you meant a comment that we made, perhaps, I know there were some conversations about your earlier, you can see that, Jen, um, when you did the quote, we can't provide accommodations to anyone unless they're registered. Maybe they can do a whole session just on that quote alone. Um, because I, I think that others have had probably similar or different experiences. I've been at different universities. I've had very different experiences at different universities. I'll just say that. Um, that this is not necessarily so um no it's perfect that's why we're having the conversation um and so yeah um donna just to say so we did start out that way like that's my lens but i wanted to back it up because my students don't only take courses um in the teacher preparation program they take courses you know their first two years we can't they can't take any courses in our program so by the time they get to us um they've had two years full full of courses taught by instructors all over the university. And so that's why we wanted to back it up and say like, what's the culture at our university before we honed in on our college? So you're not wrong. We did say we started there with our questioning. We just broadened it back out before we did our survey. So another thing was about, uh, you know, faculty not knowing what some of these terms were. And we, so because they could be defined and implemented in different ways, we really did want to fish for, what their perception was um, and, and test the waters. Do people, you know, know what multiple means? Does it mean anything to them? If so, what does it mean? Um, so again, pilot, we learned a lot. We learned a lot in terms of the questions and we learned a lot in terms of just some issues internally to help us navigate our new space. When I, and now we're at the COVID-19, now what? So where are we? Where did we land? Well, we, you know, Projects abound, I'll say that. Um, and they go from uh, going from a, you know, voices from a suddenly virtual campus. We'll talk a bit about students, faculty, and administrators. But what we were told to do and use and what they, so they is not defined. This was a fun conversation we had in preparation. She's like, well, who's they? I said, well, they could be anybody. So administrators told us what they wanted. But we went, um, Jen and I were probably part of a group of faculty that actually said, well, that's what you want. I'm going to go survey my students and find out what they want in terms of. And of course, they wanted choice. They wanted chat. They wanted email. They wanted to be left alone. And then sometimes they wanted Zoom. That was for me. Jen's, on the other hand, a very different group, wanted something completely different. And it was the point that it was, what do they want versus what are we being told to use? Um, and that there is no I mean, sure, consistency, I think, in terms of maybe within your, your course and your group, um, but it was, it was a very interesting experiment for us, um, which also led to the implementation of a virtual faculty lounge for connections and conversation. Uh, people who had, can I say, they, they uh, shared that they were moving online and didn't know what to do, um, I, they didn't know what to do in terms of their courses. They were throwing up PowerPoints and then that was the end of the line. Um, and so they needed choices themselves in terms of instructional practice. And so this has started that wave of, well, there's more to do and I don't know how to do it. And I think you even said that earlier, Eric, where people are being pushed into that conversation. It's not nice to say push, but um, shocked into it a little bit maybe and that they want more tools in the repertoire and they didn't necessarily have it for this quick shift um, and so that whole also synchronous versus asynchronous uh, 
the dynamic nature. And for those of us who've been teaching online for 20 years, um, it wasn't as much of a shock, which meant then it was, hey, I need some tools from you. Can you share with me what you do for these things and um, some quick strategies and new strategies for engaging students from, you know, we put some examples here. I mean, there are easily 50 plus to 100 plus, you've seen the lists and the resources that people are crowdsourcing for engaging people online. It, so these three are not the ones we were just off the top of our head, um, you know, implementing Loom for engagement, the idea people are leveraging YouTube, and that's not new necessarily, but also using social media, which has its complications, but that we were rapidly designing for engagement. Um, and yes, models and examples are awesome. Uh, Jen, do you want to yeah, um, well, I mean, Suzanne touched on the fact that her students, um, which I think many are master's students. Am I right about that, Suzanne? Yes. So, um, whereas my students are all undergrads, and so they wanted something very different. Um, my students very much were like, no, we want to have class every week. And I was like, really? Like, are you sure? Um, but then I came across issues of access when it comes to that because I have um, in one of my classes in particular, a third of the students in the course are have hearing loss. And some of them um, can access through ASL. Some of them, that's not their first language. And so they really need the English. Well, they don't use CART um, or transcription um, in the regular class because they're able to access and lip read pretty well. Well, that's very different when it comes to a Zoom call. And so I felt really um, stuck as a person who is very mindful of access, thinking, there's no way that I can provide the content that I need to and it be um, accessible for all of my students if I just use Zoom. And so I had to sort of take a step back and say like, what am I gonna do? And it was neat because I got to model for my students um, what universal design is and got to say to them like, this is not an accommodation. If this were an accommodation, I would not be using um, automatic captions because as you can see, the automatic captions are not always correct. Um, but I got to say to them, this is me trying to universally design my lessons. So I'm signing it in a little bubble. I'm also speaking it. I've got the captions down at the bottom. Um, and then they were able to do their final presentations that way. And so um, that was a a really interesting kind of spin that in the past they've always just stood up and done their presentations in class but instead I said okay you have to have multiple means of representation and you have to make it accessible for um, people who are visually impaired because I am and um, people who have hearing loss because some of our students in our class are and so I want you to be mindful of that and they're final presentations were amazing. So um, just on our own individual, I think we learned a lot about it. But then in the faculty lounge, we also had all of these conversations and got to hear how other people. So it was almost like having um, a focus group interview when we had these sessions to really hear from faculty in colleges all over our university and hear what it was that they were doing and how they were trying to um, take this con content in the middle of this pedagogy um, situation and, and get it out to students. So just to touch on the faculty lounge real quick, I know it was one of the questions. Um, we, it was, uh, as the designer, it was two weeks or less, Canvas-based, asynchronous to start uh, with dreamt up themes and organized super awesome because our, our um, central unit for developing technology is awesome. And collectively we uh, put a lot together and then followed up with synchronous sessions themed out based on the units within the court, uh, within the faculty lounge. It is very much in um, evolution based on what Learn, uh, the participants want. So we've been trying to respond to a lot of the feedback instead of we know what you need, it's what do you want and building it from that direction. So it's, again, we seem very experimental, but we are, but we're having fun with it. So <laughs> trying our best to support from every avenue as possible. Um, and uh, are we on the next slide or this? There you go. That one. Um, there was one more slide. 
didn't we have a different slide that had the if you jump real quick i think if we could to the stuff that we're the other way that we're doing i want to go forward just because we're time is going quickly this one and then we'll jump back to the others can we do that out of order jen <laughs> absolutely i totally support this <laughs> I think because we're on a roll with our conversation and people are asking about our institution specifically, you sometimes have it envisioned one, envisioned one way and then you think, oh wait, but that's so in line with what we're doing. Um, so when we talk about how that's changed where we are now, um, we talked about the virtual faculty lounge. Um, we come from a space of like, you know, our environment obviously has changed, our communication strategies have changed, our materials have changed. Um, and we were working on uh, building a college-wide inclusion statement for our syllabi before this kind of all happened. And I'll be interested to see. And I would say that that helped to start, um, among other things, uh, some of the seed planting, if you will, when we started talking on our executive committee level in our college about what if we had a statement of inclusion. Um, but that's that conversation was interesting because that conversation was do we write, we have a disability resources center statement in our syllabi. And then it was, well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a statement of welcome, you know, of all learners and so forth. And that, so that started driving the conversation again, when we start talking about those two themes of accessibility and universal design for learning and looking at the different perceptions, even within that conversation. And then it led us to our most recent activity, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our, our modules, is that where? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so we are working to um, build a professional development um, for our faculty in the College of Ed. Um, and so <laughs> us designing that is, is very much a work in progress. We just kind of kicked it off this past week, um, but it's something that we're working towards. Um, and it's not just universal design for learning. So there's also going to be um, modules created for um, equity and diversity and um, teaching English uh, to speakers of other languages, one on um, exceptional student education. And what's interesting is, um, you know, one of the chairs said, well, I think we can just combine these, right? And very many of us who were in the meeting were like, no, 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 these are different things. Um, and so we had to kind of explain why these are two very different things. And while I don't mind helping um, develop either one of the modules, they are things that need to be talked about separately. Um, while they have an intersection, they are two very different things. And both our faculty and our students need that information. And we really found, um, I, uh, I supervise interns. And when we asked our interns this year, what do you need more information on? And all of them said universal design for learning and um, special education. Like they really felt like they didn't have that knowledge. And so we ended up, those of us who are um, faculty in special education, we led a seminar for all of our interns um, in all of the disciplines about um, just meeting the needs of students um, who have exceptionalities. And it was really interesting because we were really unaware of how um, unaware <laughs> many of the students in in uh, elementary education and secondary were and the questions that they asked really helped us understand that um, some of that is coming from what they're hearing in their classes and so we can't fix it in a seminar that's given to interns we need to back back up and we need to get this information out to faculty who are who don't have that experience because maybe when they were in the classroom um, they didn't necessarily have um, that same experience because things have evolved so quickly and it's so different, the climate in public schools now versus 20 years ago. Um, UDL wasn't really a conversation then and students who um, had exceptionalities were often in, in their own classroom and were not being served in the general classroom, whereas now 80% of them are. And so our candidates, regardless of their major, need to be prepared for those things. And so um, we, uh, just a lot of conversations have happened where we've realized um, that our students aren't necessarily being prepared for this, but that's 
probably because our faculty don't necessarily have that knowledge and we can't pigeonhole it into, um, okay, you're gonna take this one class on UDL or you're gonna take this one class on um, special education. Like it needs to be infused into all of our programs. So we kind of took these big concepts and UDL is one of them. And so we're kind of starting there. Um, we'll have things to update maybe in a year. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna piggyback on that because I think it loops even back to the very beginning of what we shared which was, how do I, I know it's recording. Uh, how do we disrupt the system best and a little in positive disruption, right? And, and it came down to not just faculty knowing about it, but what if students understood universal design for learning and its value to their experience. And so that's what kind of started our thinking about not just serving faculty, but serving students. And now there is this um, opportunity to educate across the board. Um, and so, uh, you know, I see here that Tom was talking about the best way to teach UDL. I teach a UDL course as part of our program, our master's program. And I get a lot of students, not just our our master's program students, we get students from all over the College of Ed. And then it's usually, I, I do think it has been a ripple in the water in terms of conversation that these students go back to their other programs and take other courses and start asking more questions. And and that's, I mean, that's that's the opportunity that we have, right, is to, is absolutely the conversations that we're having. I always say I learn more for you than you learn from me and that class is one of my favorite in terms of reframing constantly um, the different spaces and places and ways in which UDL um, has um, a connection so um, we are we are talking a lot and we said we were going to talk as much but we're super excited about the topic super excited to share all the things that we're doing i know that we got plenty of more and i could talk for another 13 minutes um about like we have badging and seminars that we have going on this summer we're creating a udl badge for one of our units on campus and that's different that's um, another process that we're going through that's interesting which is you know um, part of our conversation was um you know, how do you teach somebody UDL in a couple modules or teach about it or talk about it? And I would say that it is something that we are, it's an introduction, but it's still challenging because, because for a thousand and one reasons, which I think a majority of the group here would probably, we would love, um, yes, I love that it takes on learning and lots of time. Yes, yes. Um, and being open to doing that. I think that has been our, uh, opportunity is to kind of make space for that um, it, it, through conversations. And I think what was interesting is we're collaborating with another colleague on campus and the beginning conversation was, I don't know a lot about this, but I'm really interested on this in this topic. And I don't, so I don't know if I can participate and we more and merrier, right? Because why don't we all have perspectives that will contribute to the conversation um, and make for great change? I don't think it's, you know, expertise that necessarily only drives that kind of change. That's the collective, at least in my opinion. So um, other, I, I can, we can keep sharing some more. We have more, but, and we had some other things, but I want to make sure that we, if we have questions, I don't know what other slides do we have too, Jen? I know there were some ones that I skipped over. <laughs> I got worried about time and I wanted to make sure that we got to some of these things because I know some others are doing um, that way. Maybe that. We were, we were going yeah. to do that activity and then we were also <laughs> just talking about, and I think that this really actually hits on what um, is being talked about in the chat right now about unlearning. Um, and so we really have talked a lot about what is the resistance. And so we kind of looked at our data and um, just at the conversations that we've had with faculty and a lot of it is just, um, you know, the, the traditions of what we've always done um, and that we have very much been used to a reactive approach, which is more of that like special education model of like we wait until we know that there's a problem and then we're going to provide the accommodation instead of designing on the front end that just makes it accessible for everyone. Um, and then also this like uh, helping mentality um, and that deficit perspective of, um, you know, that 
if we're doing this for them, then we're, and we're not doing it for everyone. And a lot of those conversations that have come up um, and just that cognitive dissonance. And so I think that this really, um, there is a lot of unlearning that has to happen, but I think a lot of times it's just that step back to um, shifting that like fixed mindset that we have, you know, that we fight against in education in general, um, not just with UDL, but with so many different things. And so I find that with my students all the time, I'm highlighting things that they're writing in their work. And I'm like, that this is, think about what you're saying here. Like, um, you know, you, you're highlighting what they can't do and you're not thinking about what the student can do. Um, and, and, trying to say okay this is what they can do so like let's continue working on that and and our students have that mindset because they've gone through a school system that has taught them that mindset and it's no different with the faculty that we have and so even the person who said well i don't know other ways to ask the questions right um I, it's, it's like me as a beginning teacher. I went to the store and bought the little workbooks and copied the um, pages because I, I knew how to do worksheets because that's the school system that I grew up in. And so it's really just a lot of that, like unlearning um, what we've been taught about fairness and what we've been taught about um, why things have to be the way that they are and just that tradition of it's always been this way so why would I do it any different so yeah um, I wonder if any of you have pedagogy has been <laughs> the disruptor yeah, right it has so now been we're suddenly thinking the way we've always done it isn't going to work in this climate so <laughs> what do we do now and I think a lot of our conversations um you know unfortunately are this is our time now but this may not be our only time to live this way so what do we do with what we've learned and can we keep that momentum? Um, I, I'm curious if, you know, others have had, I mean, we talked about, I obviously, if anybody wants to jump in on, you know, work that they've done that's similar aligns with share some of their experiences. I know we've talked quite a bit um, again, out of a place of passion and excitement. Um, I love this. I like, I like Jennifer's sharing out here some awesome resources. That's fantastic on unlearning and, and her book. And look at, I know that person who just commented. Um, there are a lot of great people who I think are actively engaged in this work. And um, I appreciate that um, you all came to share your, I, I'm, I'm pulling all these ideas here um, to, to learn more. So um what, any other questions? I know we can jump around. I don't wanna, anybody? But thanks for the feedback loops. I think some great questions, I think especially on the definition inside of the house. Um, I think that we, we have a ways to go. It would be interesting to see how students would respond now if we were to distribute the survey again and even faculty. Um, you know, our College of Ed compared to maybe even um, others across campus, um, if we were to provide then the definition as well, or our working definition maybe better said. All right. I just wanna point out what, one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing, and I'd be interested in hearing from other people as well, is, is really you're kind of moved around to different levels, sort of a systemic need for unlearning, faculty need for unlearning, and then the student need for unlearning as well. You know, and, and that the need that we have for, for metacognition at all levels, for people to begin to reflect on what are we trying to do here? And, and, and is what we're doing the best way to get there? And if not, what resources do we have at our disposal that can allow us to get there? We're seeing it like in the chat with people talking about students using TikTok and, and accomplishing exactly what the objectives were. That's the process that administrators, the faculty, the colleges can be using. Like, this is where we're going. What, how can we best get there? And it requires us to be willing to be creative, to challenge the status quo um, and, and continue to grow. But what I was super impressed with, what I'm taking away for, from all of this is how important it is to involve the student voice at those other levels, um, you know, and to, to find ways to collect that data and that voice from the students for the administrators to hear, for the faculty to hear, just like it's easier for students often to hear feedback from, from um, other students, you know, and so forth. So I think, that the faculty and the administrators ultimately we do value our students 
and maybe we need to, to find ways to amplify their voices. So thank you for that, Dan and Jenna. That's really valuable. Thank you. Does anybody else have any The, the Zoom <laughs> silence is killing me sometimes. The Zoom <laughs> silence, it's like, you know, hello. I do feel the need, the urge to fill it sometimes. <laughs> so. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you um, have questions or comments that you want to ask. Sorry. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you have questions or comments that you want to add. Well, I have a question about like what other people are doing to educate uh, their faculty members on campus uh, about using applying UDL, especially in the STEM field, and also students. How what are they doing to educate students? I know like you design your course, you teach your course using UDL is is one way. Is there any other way that anybody? Well, our, our badge, yeah, our badge will be, for example, our badge is in the NEF STEM, which is our, our um, uh, you know, unit that's doing education for teacher educators throughout the county. So that's one example, but I don't know if other. Thank you. One thing, one thing we're doing is we're, we're actually building a module that is subject agnostic that focuses on what does it mean to be an expert learner and I've had lots of faculty picking it up and putting it in as like the first thing that you go through in my class and it gets the students to think about we start by deconstructing discussion boards you know what do you think the discussion board is for and, and do you find these to be very useful why or why not you know if you could express yourself in a different way how would you express yourself and then we catch them in a trap and we're like okay then do it like right now <laughs> respond by using this other way that you just said that you could respond and lo and behold you can use canvas discussion board for things that are more than text you know <laughs> and it's just a way to begin introducing them to that and we kind of go deeper and deeper into this process of, of what is metacognition and how can you use it and why does it matter for you to be an expert learner and to communicate back with your faculty about about what you're learning about yourself that sort of thing and so that module um, a lot of faculty are now using it we created it for one class and it's, it's been duplicating um, I'm posting here that's not it give the wrong link I'll post in there a, um, a video that goes part of that module and people feel free to reach out to me and I'll give you the module itself Thank you for that, Eric. <clears throat> I'm Jane <clears throat> from Wisconsin, and um, we're working on UDL implementation across our intermediate agencies and our uh, on some districts. And um, we had a barrier for several years to implementing UDL, and that was um, choice and options, because educators saw that and they're like I already give them a choice on what topic they can write on or how they can show what they know or I can't manage all those choices um, but that was usually the first way people dipped into UDL um, but when we really pivoted is when we really leaned into the goal that UDL articulates so well and that is expert learners and the characteristics or descriptors of expert learners are wonderful cues for designers to use to design experiences as the targets. And then whatever content and skills have to be taught and scaffolded um, to get there because the, the pandemic has shown that educators have had to be expert learners. They've had to abandon plans that don't work. They've had to get really clear on what their goals are. They've had to um, be flexible. Um, they've had to use different formats. So those descriptors have been really helpful. And we're gonna use this as a way to catapult Wisconsin into this idea of us all being learners and that UDL is really a design framework, but it rests on a mindset. So it's what you think about what you do. And if we're asking about accessibility, people think about their phones, they think about um, disabil seen disabilities, but there's a lot of abilities that aren't seen that are disabled by the learning conditions. 
And that's really what UDL is. UDL is heightening the unseen abilities that the barriers in the designed environment are putting in there and that we need to mitigate using the guidelines. So um, UDL gets, um, loses its credibility when we lean into um, different formats for text as a representation of UDL by itself. And it isn't anchored in what's the learning goal and how is the goal worthy of people's time informed by the user and um, yeah, serves a bigger purpose than control and compliance. So um, we have a lot of work to do, but I, I like the surveying um, you know, idea and uh, we're gonna be doing more evaluation in Wisconsin. And um, we're just really trying to stay on the bass drum beat of some of these fundamental things about UDL and then let the context and the learner goal and the resources and the learners themselves go off on all the riffs because a list of resources and tech tools just overwhelms people. We, we've, we've, we've tried that, it doesn't work. It doesn't get us closer to equitable, equitable opportunities for high levels of learning. So we're so grateful for you. We're grateful for CAST and other thought partners and um, appreciate being here today. Thanks. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, these hours sure, sure go by fast. Um, this is a great community to connect with. One of the reasons we have you all drop your emails or Twitter handles in there is so that you can continue to connect with each other after the meeting. Um, there is a great need for more research like the research that Suzanne and Jenna have been doing. Um, and I hope that that gets published soon as well. There is a great call for research in UDL in online learning right now from um, JAID. Um, which is an AECT journal. I posted a link in the chat and it's also in the Google Doc. Um, so take a look at that. This is a hot opportunity to, to do that research. Um, and if you don't have enough authors at your institution, use this group. That's one of the, the goals of this group is to network each other so that we can author together as well um, and have more participants across our different schools. So thank you again, Suzanne and Jen. It's been wonderful. And we hope to see you all soon.